I want to explain something that um, in a weird way connects to with a project I did in 2010 in Magba that David was mentioning called the Manady of Writing. And um, I did it at the time without exactly knowing what I was doing and it was in connection with another show that was as weird as the book show that was on television. So I started working in, um, in an exhibition but actually it was not an exhibition. I started working on a library where I collect 160 novels that uh, I was also reading and then I was at the same time um, collecting television programs of uh, very strange nature. On the one hand, I was collecting um, apparitions of artists on television. On the other, I was collecting philosophers on television. And the third family of programs were uh, programs uh, dedicated, about, dedicated to contemporary art on television. Mostly, instead of taking the uh, usual ones from English and American television, I was doing an extended research uh, on Latin American programs about contemporary art on television. And the most famous one is the one of Marta Trava that started at the end of the 50s and lasted till the beginning of the 80s in Colombia. So um, it is really strange to link these two projects, one that was just a presential library that was collecting my own research. So uh, from 2003 on, I was just uh, start collecting novels or kind of fictional writing or writing done by artists without exactly knowing what to do with it. And then at the moment that I was doing this television show that was mostly about uh, dealing with the notion of uh, thinking, propositional thinking and speculation, I decided that it was a good moment to, <clears throat> uh, to present the library in the Center of Research and Documentation of uh, MAGBA. So um, how did that uh, exhibition start? I was at the same time researching, I think MAGBA did have an extensive collection of artist books and an extensive collection of artist texts. It means that uh, books done by artists that they declared they were an artwork. And then on the other hand, it was another family, which was all the texts that uh, artists wrote about their own practice that was also in the collection. And then um, there was this third family of books that they were not artist books, they were not declared as artworks, and they were also not theory books. Uh, they were just uh, another kind, they were just novels. And they were just not replicating novels, they were not acting like novels, they were just novels. So it was difficult to explain them as an artwork or explain them differently than you would explain a normal novel. They were normal novels, they were novels. So um, the question was um, coming from a line that I wrote in one of the magazines that uh, Magbag was collecting called The Fox. In 1975, Mark Klimberg uh, wrote a line saying, could you imagine a novel that uh, in, um, you know, in developing itself as a fiction writing would uh, challenge and change and affect the whole history of the reception of uh, modernism? Um, so it was a very interesting line for me because at that time I thought that uh, in writing a novel and being a novelist, the writers were um, writers and artists and they were actually presenting a different way of understanding something that is in the novel, but is also beside the novel, which is called theory. So I thought at the time that I was in front of a collection of theory books, that they were presenting or disguising themselves as novels, but they were novels at the same time. So there was no contradiction in taking them as novels and taking them as theory. And actually reading them as theory in counterposition to another theory, which is a theory that uses argumentative thinking instead using hypostasis. It means to use an argument or an hypothesis that then you uh, would uh, kind of act or enact through, uh, through argument. So this kind of non-argumentative theory or this theory that was kind of uh, besides uh, a rational understanding of theory was interesting to me at that time. Uh, later on, I did not thought of more about it. I just collect these books and present them. Um, one of the major uh, challenges of this project at the time was that it took me three years to present the library because it took me three years to read all the material that I was myself collecting. Um, it was difficult to read these novels and was also difficult to read, uh, you know, to present them as books without reading them. 
And sometimes I did enjoy reading them, and sometimes I really hate reading them. So, but I thought that in the very manner that you need to see the material, and you need to do studio visits, and you need to understand every other material that you present as a curator, I needed to read all these books in order to understand what exactly was I presenting in that presents library. So you could not borrow the books, and um, space was habilitated in Magba for you to go and read them. So, and it was a very simple, it was nothing artistic about it. It was just a shelf with 160 novels. So, as I said, um, I was just working intensely, intensively through this uh, material, but I was not thinking much about it, apart from just um, opening it to the public. Uh, years later, like uh, eight months ago, um, I accepted the position as the chief curator in Museo del Barrio in New York. I only accepted this position because of a very particular fact. This is the only museum in the world that has been founded by an artist. It's not an artist space, it's not an artist-run organization, it is a museum. And this museum um, has been declared a performance by an artist. That uh, declaration, which may belong to the world of fiction, it's actually true. It exists as a museum. It's a museum with a collection of more than 8,000 items in it, and it functions as a museum. But it's also true that the artist, um, Rafael Montañez Ortiz, declared that this is one, not only one of his most accomplished artworks, but it's actually the artwork that makes every other artwork produced by him understandable. Rafael Montañez Ortiz uh, was with Al Hanson, the only participant of the, in the Congress for the destruction of the arts that took place in uh, London in 1966. And after going to London, he came back to the States and uh, started a series of performances and works where destruction um, was in, like, the main point or the main um, um, modus operandi of his work. But um, apart from before or prior to all these performances that took place from 1969 on, uh, he founded that museo, El Museo del Barrio. Um, when I went to talk to him, and everyone told me that uh, he was the founder, and I assumed that he was the founder meant that it's an artwork, but everyone or never uh, anybody else mentioned that it was an artwork, and it was a fiction, it was real. So if it is real, if it is a museum, it has nothing to do with the world of fiction, and actually it was very difficult to kind of understand this paradoxical reality of a museum being both uh, acting as a museum, an institution being institutionalized, and at the same time being an artwork. The first thing he told me is, do you know that um, the Museo del Barrio, where you are in, working every day, is a performance uh, by myself? And I said, yes, I think so. That's why I accepted the job, and that's why I think it's a really interesting reversal of, uh, of a situation. And then he said, yes, and do you know the reasons why I did it? And then I thought, well, I, I kind of I have an intuition of why you did it, but actually I would like you to explain me um, what, is the, what does the work consist on. And then he said, um, the most important thing for me was at the time, and it is still now, and I want you really to understand that. And if you don't understand that, um, it's better that you don't even uh, keep on working in this institution, is that um, in prior to every exhibition, you need to understand that inside Museo del Barrio, there is a rainforest. I quite not understood what he meant by being, um, by having a room or actually having a rainforest previous to every uh, exhibition or any other activity. He told me that uh, at the time he himself did also not quite understood what he meant by the idea of having a rainforest, but that he needed to have this rainforest as prior to any thinking about the production of art and prior to any encounter in between the social groups that they were to activate El Museo. So El Museo, that actually came about after a series of very intense riots, um, um, majorly like, initiated by the Puerto Rican community in the Harlem, but also the African Americans in the Harlem, that are linked to the claim uh, for uh, civil and social rights in the mid-60s and the late 60s, um, was for him like a way to invocate the possibility of two groups that are 
historically, but also, let's say, ontologically disconnected, being connected. He talked, literally, about the lower classes, the classes, the uneducated classes, and the high art, or the educated bourgeois, and the uh, civil society. So um, he proposed to me to think about the rainforest. So um, I went home with the idea of, uh, you know, what does he mean by a rainforest being prior to any other thing in the museum, or actually, what does he mean um, with this idea of a rainforest inside the white cube? Um, we have been, uh, of course, understanding the conditions and the limits of the white cube historically, um, and then in the new institutionalism turn, we um, curators uh, tend to explain that a way to avoid certain limits of the exhibitionary complex and the limits that the architecture, even the neutrality of the conditions of a space uh, that imposes into a work was to produce uh, discursive practices or to turn artworks into projects. So, you know, going from some kind of the heart into the soft or uh, going into the heart for, to the liquid, no? Like you could understand that this kind of turn to the project, turn to the discursivity, turn to the fiction, turn to the words, was a way of turning to something more liquid, but actually never challenging this kind of dialectic symmetry that exists in between a hard white cube and a soft white cube, or the cold, the architecture of neutrality, and the hot. Uh, the kind of process and procedures of the project oriented or the more fictional words toward the uh, literary words or the theory words understood as arguments uh, towards um, like presenting an hypothesis of work, for example. So he was definitely not um, into that kind of symmetrical or dialectical relationship in between the white cube and the rainforest. He was not telling me, choose, uh, you need to do a museum as a rainforest. You, need to, you don't need to do a museum that resembles um, um, a rainforest. You don't need to do anything that also explores the possibility of representing a rainforest inside the white cube. He was definitely not talking about it. So what was he talking about? So for many months, I was trying to understand what is he actually talking about till I encountered um, a very interesting explanation that levi Stroh did uh, when he tried to explain the difference in between a game, um, like a game and a ritual. So um, I've been obsessed during the whole process of Documenta by understanding the necessity of um, symmetry and dissymmetry. It means the process of synchronizing yourself uh, in a situation with an artwork, in a space, in a time, and also the possibilities of uh, an understanding of desynchronizing yourself with uh, a space, with a time, with an artwork. So I thought also that if uh, there is a possibility of producing a different understanding of time, this possibility kind of uh, comes about through the artistic production and through quantum physics more than in any other realm of, uh, of the real. So um, Levi-Strauss says that uh, the very, it's very important in order to explain relationships, um, the, to understand the difference in between game and ritual. He said that in a game, uh, everything departs from a situation of symmetry. There is certain rules, and we do understand the rules, and the rules are equal for everyone. So the situation, the departing situation, is one of symmetry. We are symmetric. Then an event happens, circumstances happen, and asymmetry arises. Something which is not symmetric does happen, which is there is a winner. Only one wins. On the other hand, the ritual uh, departs from the contrary or from the reverse situation. Um, there is an event, and the event is that we are unequal, and it's only through this um, kind of timing of the event that we create a symmetry. It means that every one of us in the ritual, we are equals. So uh, this, what uh, um, levi is explaining, is what in literature you call chiasm. A chiasm is just a reversal. So like, one moment. Like this. This is a reversal. It's a very simple reversal. So um, this is Mogui, you know him. That's from the Book of the Jungle. And he is adopted by a bear and a panther. 
So, yeah, that's very simple. Um, so definitely, uh, the proposition of Rafael Montañez Ortiz was to propose a museum functioning in the logic of a ritual. There is the event, there is the unevenness, there is the asymmetric situation inside every museum and institution, and there's also a symmetric situation among the works that are presented. And then the modernistic canon, or the way that we are reading it, it's like, the, let's say, the economy of the art world, in his words, would function like game. So economy equals game. Uh, there is a certain number of artists, there is a canonical reading of this production, and there is certain winners and certain non-winners or losers, or whatever you want to call it. And at that time, and I think even today, he was aiming for a much more ritualistic way of understanding the art world. So he was actually departing from this unevenness, trying to understand the possibility of defying it, and then creating um, a structure which is symmetrical at the end of the process. So from all this number of events, creating this kind of uh, situation of symmetry among all those involved into the play. So this is a reversal because, um, you know, we normally don't think about it, about art spaces as pr producing this kind of ritualistic understanding of the art world and so on and so forth. And in order to understand it, I just choose this image because it was very simple. What he wanted to propose to me is the same reversal that you normally have in order to create an image that is uh, not a metaphor, because it's not that moqui equals an animal, the animals don't equal the human, but it's a reversal in the sense that you need to create a relationship in between these two um, uh, natures, or in between these two logics, and then uh, produce a new typology. So it's all about a new typology of a relationship. At the end of the road is all about uh, redefining a theory of um, citizenship, if you want. So, um, as you see in the image, um, it is the same as the rainforest. I think what Rafael Montañez Ortiz was proposing to me is to invent or to imagine a white cube that was able to adopt a rainforest in the same manner that we are um, able to imagine a kit adopted by a panther and a bear. So this is completely uh, possible to think. And you, co you could call it fiction, but uh, actually it is theory. And this theory, it's based on a certain ways of understanding rhetoric. So, and rhetoric is um, a notion of logic that is uh, necessary uh, to, um, to think or to understand speculation. So, all this uh, discourse is just to explain uh, that I think that um, an artist writing a novel is a novelist. And then um, that there is a process of adoption of uh, the novel happening by an artist. And it's a way of defying the game versus the ritual, understanding not only that you are talking about fiction, which is completely um, uninteresting, I think, but that you are defying the visual towards something else that happens in the text and does not happen in the eye, that happens in the ear and does not happen in the senses, that it happens in the head, and that has to do with theory and with an understanding of concepts, not as conceptualism practices, but as the kind of the kind of bodies or the vessels for a thinking uh, that is quite not yet here, but that we need to explore. So um, I would claim that the malady of writing was the same as the proposition of Raphael uh, when he was saying, try to invent a new typology where a white cube is able to um, adopt a rainforest in the same manner that an artist is able to adopt the novel as a format. But also, I think, and therefore I'm very happy that I am coming after Momos, it, do, it does have to do with humor. Um, I still don't know how, but I think that there is something very revelation in artists writing novels, and that there is something uh, very similar to that proposition of uh, Rabelais when he was presenting Pantagruel as being born through the ear of his mother, because she was absolutely, um, you know, she was eating so much that he was a spell 
of uh, her body, not through the normal um, birth channel, but through an ear. So um, there is something to think about um, in that image, and also to remind us that humor is an historical constructum that is kind of at the core of modernity in the same um, manner that the novel is. So, as I said, I think that's all about typologies and producing new ones. Thank you.